I'm Teresa Caraggio, and this is Third Paradigm. My topic today is the Curse of Babel. And to introduce that topic, I've brought you a chandelier. I don't have a lava lamp this time, even though my Christmas amaryllis is still hanging in there, and I appreciate that. But this arrived today, which is for the princess room that I have turned my library into so that my 31-year-old daughter can be a princess when she comes to visit. Now, she is the hardest working princess I think I've ever heard of, but if you too have fantasies of being a princess, you can come stay in that room too. I'm sure that we'll be filming from it. And for Amy of What's in a Name Really, I am expecting to see some extravagant AI chandeliers. Amy has been egging me on in my sassy intros, so if you would prefer that I just get down to business, you have her to blame. So let's move our Amy Rillis and show you the book that in addition to the biblical Babel, I'm going to be talking about this book. Babel by R.F. Quang Quang is the other thing that we're going to delve into. I'll start with a quote from the book. Hence the vanity of translation. It were as wise to cast a violet into a crucible that you might discover the formal principle of its color and odor as seek to transfuse from one language into another the creations of a poet. The plant must spring again from its seed, or it will bear no flower. And this is the burthen of the curse of Babel. And that is by Percy Bysshe Shelley. We all know the story of the Tower of Babel, but what I want to do is put it in context. Where we last left off with our biblical analysis was looking at Noah, And so Noah gets drunk after he turns the vineyards that he's made into wine and falls asleep naked. Ham, his son, talks about it, where Shem and Jepheth walk in backwards carrying a cloak and cover his nakedness. In retaliation for this, he curses Canaan, who in some of the stories seems to be Ham's son, and in others seems to be Noah's son. So why he curses Canaan for Ham talking about him being drunk and naked is unclear. This means that Shem is given the inheritance. He is given the blessing. And the inheritance means that with this rite of primogenitor, where he inherits everything because The story of the flood means that they are the only people. They are in charge of the entire world. And so Shem has the ability to rule over all of the people in the world after the flood story. And the Canaanites are all cursed to be their slaves in perpetuity. And the descendants of Ham, who according to Josephus, were Africa Egypt, and parts of Asia. That's a big responsibility. Genesis 10 then names all the clans of the sons of Noah, Shem and Jepheth and Ham and also Canaan. And then 10.32 says, These are the clans of Noah's son, according to their lines of descent within their nations. From these the nations spread out over the earth, after the flood. And then the footnote reads, the sons of Noah's favored son, Shem, were the Shemites or Semites. Shem's successor was Arphazax, who had Shelah, father of Eber, from whom the word Hebrew comes. Eber has two sons, Peleg and Joktan. Joktan has 13 sons for 13 tribes. And then it continues in Genesis 11. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. 
they used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. In my book, I write about the word barbarian and how it comes from the same root as Babel because it was a foreigner who didn't speak proper Greek or someone who was lower class. So now let's look at how the story continues. It goes back and repeats the genealogy of Shem. But this time it gets to Eber, the Hebrew, and he only has Peleg. There is no Joktan. So Joktan is demoted with other sons and daughters. And instead, his 13 tribes for 13 sons disappear. They are scattered. They become those others who don't have the inheritance. So let's look at what this does. If you don't have the story of Babel, then you have the question, where did all these languages come from? If everyone after the flood came from Noah's family, giving them the right to decide who rules over all the rest of the family, then why did other languages develop? Especially when you can see that they come from completely different roots. It gives the lie to the right to rule. And without it, the Hebrews become just another conquering horde, just someone else who are slave owners and slave traders. Their legitimate right to rule is taken away. This goes back to a recurrent theme in the Bible, which is the younger son stealing the inheritance of the older. In the first genealogy, Joktan's 13 sons are all named and they all have their own nations. And that is how you see who is the one who gets the inheritance, because otherwise they're just other sons and daughters. They're never named. In the second genealogy, Joktan doesn't even exist. And you go to Peleg, whose name means the earth was divided, who has Ru, who has Sereg, who begets Nahor, who spits out Terah, who at the ripe old age of 70 has Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Terah then goes with Abram and Nahor's son Lot to Canaan, but only makes it as far as Haran. So Abram is the first to be named as a Hebrew in the Bible. And I'll continue with his fascinating story at another time. Abram then inherits the right to rule the world based on the story of Babel, which is based on the story of the flood. Without these twin myths, all people would be seen logically as sovereign. And there is no one Who could have the God-given right to rule over everyone else? On the substack, I'll have a map, just out of curiosity, that Rhonda posted. And this is a 1743 map of Cairo, Egypt. In the bottom right area, it shows a landmark temple that is marked with the Muslim crescent moon and identified as Sulpogra Judeareum. Very curious. Now let's look at the book Babel. If you've watched for a while, 
you know that I have a soft spot for sci-fi. I don't mind a little escapism, but I also think there's a way that you can tell truths by putting it in a different world. And I like that kind of world building. The other thing that I have a soft spot for is etymology. I have been known to travel when I'm traveling by car with my Chambers Dictionary of Etymology. And Babel combines the best of both worlds. What it doesn't combine so much is escapism because it deals with deep, deep issues of colonization. It is dark. It is so dark that when I went to the bookstore because I loved it so much and wanted to buy everything else that the same author had done, I got The Poppy War, and that has a three-part series of Dragon Republic and The Burning God, and then both the sales clerk and someone I ran into at a restaurant said, you know, those are even darker than Babel. I had to put it away a few times just to get through it. So then I got more cozy sci-fi, as the genre is being called, so that I could make my way through the poppy war when I'm traveling. Let me read you the premise of Babel. 1828, Robin Swift, orphaned by cholera in Canton, is brought to London by the mysterious Professor Lovell. There, Robin trains for years in Latin, ancient Greece, and Chinese, all in preparation for the day he'll enroll in Oxford University's prestigious Royal Institute of Translation, also known as Babel. Babel is the world's center for translation and, more importantly, magic. Silverworking, the art of manifesting the meaning lost in translation using enchanted silver bars, has made the British unparalleled in power. And so... It's a fascinating premise. So what they do with these silver bars is inscribe two different words in different languages that have a jump in meaning and that the bar itself makes that jump and creates whatever effect that it is. And I remember when I was studying the psychology of creativity that what people remember for longer are things that are incomplete Once something is complete, you shelve it away in your memory. But if it's left undone, where in your imagination you have to complete it, then it sticks. So this has many fascinating tidbits of etymology, including the word etymology itself coming from etymon, which means source. And Nefahotep will really like that there is a lot of Sanskrit in here. And theory comes from the Greek theoria, meaning sight or spectacle, same as theater. Meticulous comes from the Latin meaning fear or dread, metis, and only later became the fear of making a mistake. And even balderdash was coined as that drink that the bartender makes at the end of the night from everything that they haven't run out of yet. It also gives a fascinating history of all these bastard children from these London Oxford scholars who have gone into the colonies because they need both the silver from the colonies and also the languages. Those are the languages that work for them. So they have this extractive model and this weird relationship with these young people who then end up rebelling. And it gives histories that I knew, but even at a deeper level. For instance, the Luddites... I was afraid it was going to give me the standard translation for that, but no, it knew more than I did about how all of that started and who the heroes were of those Luddites, because in this, it's silver that's taking everyone's jobs. That's the industrial revolution that has turned craftspeople who are well-paid and in charge of their own work 
into low-paid factory workers in dangerous conditions. It gives an amazing history of the Opium Wars, and I'm sure that the other three books are going to go much deeper into that. But this just told me many things that I didn't know about how that came about and the kind of resistance that was put up against it. There is such a mind-boggling amount of knowledge that is packed into this book that I think I had to look at the photo of the author a dozen times. So Rebecca Quang looks like a schoolgirl. She's getting her PhD at Yale, but how in the world does someone that young get this much knowledge? I'll be keeping you informed when I read The Poppy Wars and have the stomach for it. But in the meantime, here is When Words Die, Worlds Die on Indigenous Languages. And this is The Devil and Naomi Wolf that looks at the Canaanite curse. Thank you for watching.